Salvete, welcome to this video lesson on chapter 34, Capitulum uh, Tregesimum Quartum of Lingua Latina per se illustrata, and we are starting at section 2 here. Um, the family, Julius, Emilia, and their uh, guests are discussing poetry. Tum Julius, qui artis poeticae studiosus est, then Julius, who is eager or interested in the poetic art. Now, studiosus, that adjective, takes an objective genitive, thus artis poeticae genitive. But we want to say eager about or interested in. So we definitely don't want to go with an of here in English, just idiomatically. All right. He says, O videos ipse inquit e dicit. Says Ovid himself says that. Okay, so he's quoting the words of Ovid. And these were the words from last uh, video lesson. They come, the girls come to watch. They come in order that they themselves be watched. Okay. Ecce principium carminis quod scripsit. Look, the beginning of the poem, which he wrote, ad amicam secum in circo sedentum, to his girlfriend, and notice the um, participle agrees with that in the accusative, to his girlfriend sitting with him in the circus. Now, the circus, um, here we're probably talking about the Circus Maximus, but there are other circuses as well. It is a oval-shaped race course, mostly for chariot racing, although you could also have horse races on it as well. And here is his poem. Non nega nobilium stereo studioso secorum, cui tamen ipsa faves wincat ut ille precor. Now, hopefully you can hear the rhythm in this. You've got a long short shorts or long long as you go through there. And it gives a kind of rhythm. And again, Roman and Greek poetry did not really do the rhyme thing like a lot of English poetry. Um, but the Romans definitely did like alliteration, like we do in English, and a, a variety of other devices. And both Greek and Roman uh, poets use meter based on long and short syllables. So there's a rhythm to the lines like you might get in a sonnet or in a haiku. So, translation. The known here goes with the studiosus. Um, so we've got poetic word order. Nobilium goes with equorum. And then the known goes with studiosus. I sit not eager, known studiosus, uh, about noble horses. Okay, so this is Ovid the poet speaking. He's saying to his girlfriend, I'm not sitting here because I'm really interested in these noble, well born horses that are racing. And then in the next line, again, we've got poetic word order. Precor is the main verb, and then you get ut ille wincot. The ut ille would go before wincot in a normal um, bit of prose. And then I would take the la last, the first clause here in this line, last. So I pray that that one win whom she herself, or you yourself, favor, because Fawes has a U ending. Now he's again talking to his girlfriend. So I'm praying that that guy or that horse win which you yourself favor. So he's not there because he's interested in the horses, but he's there to support her sort of as a co-fan, right? Because if he's interested in her as a girlfriend, well, this will make her happier. And the Tommen I didn't translate, so let me put that in there. It's never the lesser still. Still, I am praying that that guy win whom you yourself favor. All right, and going on with this poem. And again, poetic word order. In normal word order, Wayne would come first. I came in order that I might speak with you. He's still talking to his girlfriend. And that I might sit with you. Lest, or so that not, uh, let's do it with the so that not. So that the love which you make, and I think that means which you produce in me, would not be not known to you. Now, not known is poetic for unknown. So that the love which you make, which you produce in me, Ovid is saying to his girlfriend, not be unknown to you. Now, this kind of uh, wordplay with the not known, meaning that it be really well known, um, is litotes. So it's rhetorical understatement through the use of a negative and litotes, that's spelled L-I-T-O-T-E-S. 
All right. You watch the races. I, you. Now, that means I watch you. So we've got ellipsis of the verb, ellipsis, E-L-L-I-P-S-I-S. -L -L -I -I that is another rhetorical device uh, for the sake of brevity. A good author will often drop out something you can understand in the context. So you watch the races. I watch you. And then let's both watch what is pleasing. Okay, so spectamus, present subjunctive, notice the vowel change, and then Uterque means each, or as I did, you could say both in English idiom. Let's each watch what is pleasing. In other words, you watch the races, you like that, I watch you, I like that. And, oh, and I love this one, another present subjunctive verb, Pascat, would normally have an I in the indicative, and here it has the A for present subjunctive. And let each feed their own eyes. Okolosua. So again, we've got poetic word order there. The suos goes with the okolos. And this, this kind of word order, partly it makes it more fun. Partly it, it gives it the right rhythm, right? Um, that rhythm that we're talking about with the long short shorts or the long longs. All right. And then Cornelia says, oh, and, and let me let me actually read this in Latin so you can hear the rhythm. Ut locorer te cum veni te cum quesederim. Ne tibi no tus quim fiacis esit amor. Tu cursus spectas ego te specte masuterque. Quod juvat at quocolos pascat uterque suos. All right, Cornelius says, Ego memoria teneo versus ovidi. I hold in memory the verses of Ovid. De puella quae poetam industrium prohibebat, bellum Trojanum canere et fatum regis priami. So I hold in memory the verses of Ovid about a girl who prevented a hardworking poet from singing the Trojan War and the fate or doom of King Priam. So what does that all mean? Basically, he's remembering some lines of Ovid where he is talking about a girl keeping the poet from writing war epic, epic about great and noble wars, particularly the Trojan War here and the fate of King Priam. Priam was the king of Troy who ends up dead at the end of the Trojan cycle because he's killed by Achilles' son, Neoptolemus. Okay, so let's go into these verses of Ovid. Sepe mei tandem dixi desce de puellae, in gremio sedet protinus illa meo. Often I spoke, I said to my girl, may I puellae go together, poetic word order. At last, get out of here. At last, go away, right? So tandem is a synonym for postremo or demum, denique, and discade is, again, a synonym for exe. Get out of here. Go away. Depart. Leave. <laughs> All right. So apparently his girlfriend was bothering him, and he, and he said to his girl, just get out of here at last. I don't want you anymore. Finally, go. All right. She straight away, illa protinus, sat, in my, sat down in my lap. And again, Grimio and Mayo go together, poetic word order. Often I said, it's shameful, Pudet. She, Illa, with her, her tears scarcely held in, lacrimis, and then weeks is the scarcely or barely, retentis, with her tears scarcely held in, said, me miseram, poor me, yam te dixit amare, Pudet, now it's shameful to love you, she said. Implicuit quesuos circum mea colac lacertos. And she plied her arms, suos lacertos, or we could say she folded her arms or she entwined her arms, circum mea cola, around my necks. Now, cola is a plural here. That's what we call a poetic plural. A lot of times poets or, you know, a fancy stylistic author will use a plural where we know it really just means the singular, right? I don't think Ovid had multiple necks. So she plied her arms around my necks, poetic plural. Et quae me perdunt os mille dedit. And 
she gave me a thousand kisses, Mila Oskola, which are doing me in, which are destroying me. Now, of course, that's a bit of a metaphor. The, the kisses aren't actually destroying him, but they're <laughs> they're destroying him with their love, right? Winkor, I am conquered. There's another metaphor, right? Uh, usually this is used in the context of athletic victories or military victories. Uh, I am conquered here just means he's done in by her love. Et ingenium sumptis revocatora barmis. And my nature, my talent, ingenium is about um, inborn qualities, right? My nature, my talent is called up, is recalled again. Notice the ray prefix, by arms having been taken up, or from the arms having been taken up. Now, arms here in the sense of weapons, arms and armor. And again, I think we're talking metaphorically here. These are the arms or weapons of the uh, soldier of love, right? I know this because Ovid particularly likes this metaphor of the soldier is... Um, the soldier lover, right? The lover as a soldier. He loves that and he does, he has one poem that the whole poem is about that. And in a lot of his other poetry, he, he deals with that um, theme as well. All right, and the last line, Res quedomi que estas et mea bella cano. And I sing, cano, things done at home now, race guest I are sort of deeds or noble things done. It's often used of history and great deeds of battle and war. So it's a little bit funny to have it do me at home. Um, so it usually refers to race guest I belly at war, right, or in war. So, and I sing of things done at home, noble deeds done at home, and my pretty things, I guess. Now, here's the Here's the the issue here. We've got some uh, double meaning because bellum, the noun, bellum, belli, neuter, means war. So bella here could be wars, plural. But bellus a um, the adjective, means pretty or charming. That is, uh, it can be kind of a synonym for pool care. And uh, I think that's the primary meaning here. I sing of my pretty things, meaning my girlfriend and our love affair. Um, and that's how they're suggesting out in the margin where they say mea bella essentially means meos amores. But it can also mean war. So because of that double meaning in this context where we're talking about love as war, it's clear the poet is punning on this word here, right? The word with two different meanings. So that's called figura etymologica. It's a pun um, that particularly is based on the etymology, the meaning of the roots. Or it might play on them and not even be the real meaning, but based on the sound of the roots. Okay, Fabia then says, Iste poeta viri solis plaquet. That poet of yours pleases men only. Now, I don't, I don't really agree with Fabia here, but this is her point of view. And certainly, um, you know, Ovid, like a lot of his culture, could be um, maybe a little... Um, patriarchal at times. But I would say Ovid, more than most of the male authors of the ancient world, does like to look at things from a feminine point of view. Uh, he wrote a whole sequence of poems called the Heroides, where he basically is impersonating various women from mythology, and he writes about the awful things the men have done to them. So again, giving it from the feminine point of view. And uh, in his Ars Amatoria, he writes um, the first two books of that are for men. How do you get girlfriends? How do you win them over if you like them? And then the, the last book of Ars Amatoria, he actually writes um, to give advice to women. Okay, you want to, you know, date this guy. This is how you get him interested in you. So I think Ovid, more than a lot of ancient authors, is interested in uh, women's issues to some extent. All right. But moving on, so that poet pleases men only. She clearly doesn't like Ovid, or at least these lines of Ovid as much. May wero magis yuant carmena bella quae catolo scripsit ad lesbiam amicam. But, wero, the charming poems which Catullus wrote to Lesbia, his girlfriend, please me more. Okay. 
So this is normal Latin word order, but notice that I kind of did that. I followed along with my pointer because the word order in English needs to be different. So the charming poems which Catullus wrote to his girlfriend, Lesbia, please me more. All right, so she likes Catullus. And then she says, si tibi lebet, if it is pleasing to you, Yuli, Julius, recita nobis el libro Catulli. Read out loud to us from the book of Catullus. Libinter faciam, I will do it gladly. I will gladly do it. Inquit Julius, says Julius, sed yam nimis obscurum est hoc triclinium. But now uh, this dining room is too dark. In tenebris legere non possum, I am not able to read in the shadows. Lucernas akindite servi, slaves light the lanterns. And here we see a lucerna in the margin. This is an oil lamp. You would have a wick that comes up through the spout right here, and you light the wick, and the oil is down in here. Lucernis akensis, ablative absolute, with the lanterns lit up. Akensis is from the fourth principal part of this verb, akendo. Notice it's related to kindle and incendiary and other things like that in English. Julius librum Catulli proferi ubit. Julius orders the book of Catullus to be brought forth. Notice that's a compound of ferro, ferre, to bring or bear or carry. Tum incipiam inquit. Then he says, I shall begin. Notice the A for the future tense. This is the A and E type future. A Carmine de Morte Passaris, from the poem about the death of a sparrow. Here's a passer, sparrow in the margin. Now, some people think that passer was the name of a book of poetry by Catullus, and certainly there are a couple of poems about this sparrow, which at least on the face is um, a pet of his girlfriend that dies. And there are a couple of poems about it. Um, there are some other interpretations of it as well, and if you go on to read some more Latin with me, we might talk more about that later. All right, from the poem about the death of the sparrow, Quim lesbia in delicis habuerat, whom lesbia had had in delight, or who she had kept as a pet. We could also translate this. Now notice delicii, it's translating it as that which delights one. So you can say delight, but a lot of times delicii refers to a pet, either a pet animal, or mm, you could also say like somebody who's cute and delights you, like a little kid that always like is, is cute. And so, you know, you like being around them or something like that. Ulgete o venereis cu pidenesque. Um, grieve, O Venuses and Cupids, et quantumst hominum venustiorum, and however much there is of more charming people. Passer mortaus es mei puellae, um, the sparrow of my girl is dead. Now you might notice there's a different rhythm in this. This is called a hindeca syllable, um, the meter in this poem. Passer delicii mei puellae, the sparrow delight of my girl, or pet of my girl. Quim plus illa, quim plus il locolis suis amabat, whom she loved more than her eyes. Nam melitus erat suam quenorat, for he was honey sweet and knew his own ipsam tam venequam puella matrem, his own mistress so well as a girl. And you have to understand, knows her mother. Next, a sagremio ilius moebat. All right. Nor did he move himself from her lap. Said circum siliens moduc modeluc. But jumping around now here, now there. Ad solam dominum. Uh, oh, ad solam dominusque pitiabat. Uh, he was cheeping or tweeting right up to the end, usque, to his mistress alone. Qui nunc it per iter tenibercosum, who now goes through the shadowishy way 
Um, tenebricosum is a fancy version of tenebrosus. And um, so it's it's just a fun little adjective for shadowy. Um, one of those one of things that you tend to see in poetry. All right, so who now goes through the shadowishy way? And the qui is referring, of course, back to the posser that we've described up above. Okay, now the shadowishy way is the way down to the underworld where the, the souls of the dead are. Iluk, to that place, unde negant redire quinquam, from which they deny anyone returns. At obis malesit malai tenebrae, but may it be badly for you, or just bad for you, um, you evil shadows, orki of orcus, quae, or let's say, quom nia bella doaratis, who devour all pretty things. So I think we're personifying the shadows here, right? Um, technically, they're not actually doing any devouring. So that would be, you could say it's metaphor or personification of the shadows. Tam belum mihi passer obstulistis. You stole obstulistis, so charming a sparrow from me. Now, mihi, this is a dative. We can call it a dative of disadvantage. Oh, factumale. Oh, misile passer. Oh, evil deed or badly done thing. Evil deed. Oh, pitiful little sparrow. Poor little sparrow. Tua nunc opera mei puelai. By your effort, and we might just say because of you now, my girls, may I puelai. Little eyes, O Kelly, grow red, rubent, swollen from crying. All right. And let me read that those two lines. Tua nunc opera mei puelai flendo ter geduli rubent o Kelly. All right, he suersubus ultimis, with these final verses. Poeta, the poet, veram rationem dolores sui redit, uh, renders or explains the true reason of his pain, of his grief, dolores sui. Quod oculi lesbiae lacrimis turgiderant, because the eyes of lesbia were swollen with tears, ac rubentes, and were red. Or turning red, we could also say. Tuncanem Catullus lesbiam sola mamabat, for then Catullus loved lesbia alone. Atque amorim suum perpetuum fore credebat, and he believed that her love would be perpetual. Ecce aliod carmin quo mens poetae amora quinza demonstrator. Look at the other poem in which the mind of the poet. Uh, incensed, or in other words, kindled, set on fire, with love, is shown, is demonstrated. All right, and let's stop there at line 111, and we'll pick up and finish this section in another video lesson. Valete omnes!